I would normally begin by introducing straight away the uh, uh, visiting speaker, but as uh, I have only been here for 10 days or so, I may well not be known myself to some of you. Uh, my name is Roger Kane, I'm uh, the new uh, Dean of the School of Advanced Study, and I would just like to say to those of you from within the University of London and outside how privileged I feel to be taking up this position and how welcoming I've found everyone uh, in what has been a pretty intense couple of weeks of uh, acclimatisation. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity so early on in my deanship to uh, be able to chair uh, one of the uh, lectures by our, our visiting professorial fellows. So with that word about me, let me turn uh, to uh, uh, Professor Pat Rogers. Pat uh, is a professor at the, uh, uh, in English at the University of uh, South Florida and he's uh, the uh, school's visiting uh, professorial fellow for 2009-10. He arrived here in January, so he's well established by comparison with me, uh, and he's holding his fellowship through until June, and his home institute is uh, the Institute of English Studies. Now, uh, Pat's held a post at a number of uh, very significant institutions, uh, Cambridge, London, uh, the University of Wales, and he was for 10 years uh, Professor uh, of English and uh, for quite a while, I believe, Chair of the uh, Department uh, of English at uh, the University of Bristol. Um, uh, he is a uh, scholar of uh, immense uh, academic standing and if I tell you that he was in 2008 elected a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, uh, that is just about one of the toughest accolades to achieve. Uh, there are only 10 corresponding fellows elected in any one year, open to uh, anyone who is not a UK uh, resident. By comparison, there are 35 uh, UK residents elected to an ordinary fellowship of the Academy. So if you have to be a... Uh, uh, hyper academic to be elected a corresponding fellow of the academy and I know that from uh, being part of that process so congratulations uh, Pat to your uh, election and it's great that a corresponding fellow of the academy is over here uh, in the UK interacting with uh, uh, academics here for a, a good uh, period. Um, his research uh, as we will become aware has been on the long 18th century and if ever there was a person who might be sort of uh, merit the term uh, polymath, I think Pat is one of those people. His, his, his approaches to uh, the long 18th century uh, include contributions to, and I've got a list here, literature, politics, society, e economics, music, architecture, science, medicine, and there are more. Uh, but amongst his major specialities uh, is uh, the history of the book and uh, his research here uh, in the school and in the Institute of English Studies is on Alexander Pope, uh, Edmund Curl and the London book trade uh, 1700 uh, to 1750. But he's going to speak to us tonight on the uh, intriguing uh, title uh, Checkered Careers, from Samuel Johnson and Edgar Allan Poe uh, to the Bronx Comet and a computer named Chinook. Pat, we look forward immensely to your exposition uh, to us this evening, and I invite you to present your professorial lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Roger. I'd also like to thank... Um, the former Dean Mac Edwards and all the people in the Institute of English Studies, I won't name them all, most of them aren't here, but they, those in the Institute will know who they are, but particularly for the, the help which um, Connor Wire has been giving me on almost a daily basis. Okay, this topic emerged um, from a dual anniversary last year. As many people here will know, 2009 marked both the tercentenary of the birth of Samuel Johnson and the bicentenary of the birth of Edgar Allan Poe. Now, could anything link these very disparate figures? And if so, would it be worth celebrating? Could it have some relevance to London? 
Could it even have some bearing on contemporary high beam research of any kind? I should say, by the way, this is the slide you're seeing is merely um, scene setting. This is Matisse, 1924. It's, it's, it's his family in Nice, and it's called uh, Pris et Joueur de Dame, I think. Okay, there has no relevance to what follows. <laughs> Only one subject seemed to check all these boxes. It proved to be the game of drafts, or checkers, for reasons that will become apparent. I'm going to start with Johnson's one brief foray into the literature of checkers, that is the de dedication introduction. He uh, wrote to a primer on drafts in 1756. After this, what I will be saying will divide into the statutory three parts. First, Johnson's book itself and its immediate successors with a momentary touchdown on Ben Franklin, and that's about 10 minutes. I'm shooting for 50 minutes, by the way, or just under if I can. Secondly, and at this point we will actually be moving out of the long 18th century, right up as far as the 21st in the end. Secondly, a brief survey of the game itself, one or two literary echoes, which is where Poe enters the story, its relation to chess, its current state, its standing in the new world of computerized games, and a word on the literature check it should take about 15 minutes. And thirdly, a very short cut history of the game, describing particularly its evolution as its centre gradually moved from England to Scotland to North the United States in the 19th century. And a very brief, brief um, prosopographic coda. And that should be 20 minutes in theory. Uh, let's look first at the. Uh, oh, let me go on with that slide. You, you I can have that one up. Uh, look at the introduction to the game of bra drafts. Boswell has this under the year 1756. Quote This year, Mr. William Payne, brother of the respectable bookseller of that name, published an introduction to the game of drafts to which Johnson contributed a dedication to the Earl of Rochford and a preface, both of which are admirably adapted to the treatise in which they are prefixed, to which they are prefixed. Johnson, I believe, did not play drafts after leaving college, by which he suffered, for it would have afforded him an innocent, soothing relief from the melancholy which distressed him so often. I have heard him regret that he had not learnt to play at cards, and the game of drafts, we know, is peculiarly calculated to fix the attention without straining it. There is a composure and gravity in drafts, which ins insensibly tranquillises the mind, and accordingly to the Dutch fond of it, as they are of smoking, of the sedative influence of which, though he himself never smoked, he held a high opinion. Mm -hmm. Besides, there is in drafts some exercise of the faculty. And accordingly, Johnson wished to dignify the subject in his dedication with what is most estimable in it. Observes, triflers may find or make anything a trifle, but since it is the great characteristic of a wise man to see events in their causes, to obviate consequences and ascertain contingencies, your lordship will think nothing a trifle by which the mind is inured to caution and circumspection. And then one more quote from the life. This is Boswell's account of a visit to Oxford in 1776. Quote, we walked with Dr. Adams into the master's garden and into the common room. Johnson, after a reverie of meditation, I, I used to play at drafts with Phil Jones and Sludger. Jones loved beer and he did not get very forward in the church. Sludger turned out a scoundrel, a Whig and said he was ashamed of having been bred at Oxford. He had a living at Putney, and got under the eye of some retainers to the court at that town, and so became a violent Whig. But he'd been a scoundrel all along, to be sure. Boswell, uh, was he a scoundrel, sir, in any other way than that had been a political scoundrel? Did he cheat at drafts? Johnson, sir, we never played for money. Okay, I'm not going to read, it's nothing more irritating than reading these things out from the screen. The point of PowerPoint is that you don't have to read them, so when they're legible, so at the lay term, if they aren't very legible, I'm just going to leave them for you to look at. In the first of these passages, Boswell is quoting Johnson's remark in the dedication about the value of seemingly trifle pastimes. 
he perhaps remembered his friend of comment at St Andrews in 1773 every man has something by which he caught calms himself beating with his feet or so the idea of checkers as a pacifier stress vessel or volume will recur Johnson himself stresses in his dedication the value of a harmless game as the skills required can be equally exerted in great or little things in the preface, of which I suspect he wrote only the first part, he defines the use of drafts along with other games of skill as amusing those hours for which more laudable employment is not at hand. This might be termed the idle hand argument. Some elements of the title page are worth looking at. As for the author, William Payne, teacher of mathematics, we know virtually nothing about him. He may not even have been brother of the bookseller, as Boswell asserts, but he was almost certainly a relative of that bookseller. Students of um, Hanoverian mathemat mathematics, mathematicians, of which Eve Taylor was the, the greatest, um, have not succeeded in throwing any light on it. He did produce an introduction to geometry in 1767, for which Johnson once more supplied a dedication. Further works included manuals on mensuration and trigonometry, but his most popular book proved to be Maxim's for Playing the Game of Whist, 1783, several editions. The bookseller Thomas Payne spent just a moment on Minton. He cuts a more familiar figure. His daughter Sarah married James Burney, the future admiral who went on Captain Cook's second and third voyages, and brother of the novelist Francis. Quite a lot emerges about the Payne family in the letters and early diaries of Fanny, who became friendly with Thomas Payne's two daughters. James's own game was whist, on which he wrote a published essay. His home in James Street was the scene of serious games of whist and a well-known literary haunt to Lamb, Hood, Southey, Crab Robinson, and Hazlitt. These parties were described in Charles Lamb in his essays, and indeed Martin Burney, the son of Sarah Payne and James Burney, became one of Lamb's closest acquaintances. Payne was the co-publisher of Cecilia. Franny called him a worthy old man, and most people regarded him as notably honest for a bookseller. However, the novelist's father, Dr. Charles Burney, wrote scathingly of Thomas, his two sons and successor, uh, also named Thomas, for their mean treatment of Fanny, styling them mean critters. Nevertheless, Payne did act as publisher or selling agent for the third and fourth volumes of Charles Burney's History of Music in 1789. He'd already acted in the same capacity for the rival version of History of Music by Sir John Hawkins, 1776 and he found himself caught up in the crossfire when these two competing historians of music had a set to. Thomas's will, made in 1793, survives. Actually, it takes the form rather of a personal letter, and when it was proved in 1799, witnesses had to make affidavits testifying to the fact it was indeed genuine. Thomas makes no mention of William Payne, that one we're interested in, which may indicate either the possibility he was already dead. The world ends in unusually casual fashion for such a document. Quote, I don't care where I am buried, nor how moderate as to expense. Going back now to William Payne, his was the earliest book on checkers in the English language and remains notable for setting out in print, apparently without any precedent, the classic end game in drafts known as first position, in which two kings must defeat a king and a lone piece which you might think is pretty simple, but if they're in the wrong positions on the board, if you haven't practiced it, a, a good player can defend it and get a draw, if you don't know the right way to do it. A single deviation from the correct line will end you, land you up in a kind of repetition of stone Among immediate successors to the introduction, we might note additions of Hoyle's games, 1786, we can see that Thomas Paine is listed in the imprint and he presumably had a share in the rights of Hoyle at this stage. It may be account, that may account for the fact that the section on drafts is taken over wholly from William Paine's book. The same is true of a work that appeared just a year later, William Paine's 
guide to winter painter, sorry, guide to lottery cards, dice drafts, etc., 1787. But here the sole publisher was George Kearsley, who may have required some title. Similarly, Charles Piggott's New Hoy or the General Repository of Games, 1788. Um, yet again takes the critical portion on, on drafts from Payne's book the title pages of these last three compilations place much emphasis on gaming arts and for a time drafts attained some prominence as a pastime for gamblers with its lockers set among the more raffish quarters of London this aspect of the game did not survive the Regency era, and by the time the Victorian code of manners came to the fore, the game had lost its once smart tone. There was no need for Mrs. Grandy to intervene. Meanwhile, a more serious analytic approach to dress began with the publication of a work by Joshua Sturgis called A Guide to the Game of Dress in 1800. This still used pain as a template for its treatment, both greatly augmented the manual with 500 select games it became a standard source for generations uh, subsequent two years. We might recall one not too distant echo of Johnson's dedication. This occurs in the brief essay that Benjamin Franklin wrote in his Morals of Chess, 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 published in 1786. There, Franklin stresses the need for four qualities. He's talking about chess again, remember? Foresight, circumspection, caution, and the habit of not being discouraged. His argument that chess is not merely an idle amusement chimes in with what Johnson had said in his preface to pain. And Franklin's statement that several valuable qualities of mind, useful in the course of human life, are to be acquired or strengthened by it so as to become habits already on all occasions, parallels earlier comments on drafts. It was this kind of claim that continued to be made about both games for at least a century to come, but repeated less often in the case of drafts over the last hundred years. Okay, now part two on the game itself. Here I refer exclusively to what is sometimes called English checkers or drafts, played on an 8 by 8 board with 12 pieces on each side. This version is almost entirely confined to the English-speaking world. Globally, the main form is international checkers, often called Polish drafts, which uses a 10 by 10 board with 20 pieces aside and with kings able to move any number of squares along the diagonal, like a bishop in chess. This version is not Polish at all. It was probably invented by a French officer at the start of the 18th century and then spread across Holland and Eastern Europe. This is the game which Jean-Jacques Rousseau played rather badly and which is referred to in disparaging terms near the start of Diderot's Le Neveu de Rameau. Another exponent of the Polish variant was the chess master and operatic composer uh, Philidor, François André Damicon Philidor, who wrote an opera on Tom Jones and is one of the only figures in history to have achieved distinction at both chess and drafts. Um, that's greater than the first and remains a, a big figure in chess history. When he returned to London after a long absence in 1771, Philidor had been given a letter of introduction to Charles Burney by Diderot. She had all, that, all fits together. Uh, unlike my coordination here. And in England, he collaborated with the quarrelsome Italian Giuseppe Baretti um, on a musical setting of Horace's Carmen Secularum. Bernie, Charles Bernie, helped the composer with an augmented English translation of his manual Analyse du jeu des échecs, uh, and also assisted in the choice of a new piano for Diderot. Fanny Bernie described Philidor as a well-bred, obliging, and very sociable man. He certainly met Johnson, uh, but unfortunately no record survives of their dealings, or of the conversations about drafts, which they were qualified. Um, by the way, um, in a simultaneous, bli um, simultaneous blindfold exhibition, it's not on the same occasion, Philidor played uh, chess against Thomas Bowdler, or Bowdler Fed, uh, who got a draw, and against someone whose bicentenary we could celebrate next month, 
that is the Chevalier Deon, who were lost. Numerous other variants exist, bearing names, sometimes with um, very little regard to true historic roots, such as Arabic, Turkish, Turkish and Lithuanian drafts. As for the once popular game Chinese checkers, this is neither Chinese nor checkers. Remember the checker family, it resembles Halma and was invented in Sweden in the late 19th century. That's how Chinese it is. One version that continues to thrive in America is pool checkers, which evolved in the southeast of the United States about a century ago, a little more. A cross between Polish and English checkers that's enjoyed considerable following in the African American community and is played with minor variants in some Slav Slavic countries. Pool checkers has its own championships and tournaments with major clubs in Chicago and Detroit. I don't know how to do them in Detroit now in the current palace situation in that city. Oh, that was the one we talked about. Okay, you recognize me too. Of course, the question which has vexed many minds and possibly already is stirring in yours is the nature of the difference between chess and drafts, English drafts. Perhaps the boldest attempt to draw a line comes at the beginning of Edgar Allan Poe's Murders in the Rue Morgue. You need to have read that story, probably don't remember this passage. It's 1841. Quote. I will therefore take occasion to assert that the higher powers of the reflective intellect are more decidedly and more usefully tasked by the unostentatious game of drafts than by the elaborate frivolity of chess. In this ladder, where the pieces have different and bizarre motions with various and variable values, what is only complex is mistaken for what is profound. The attention is here called powerfully into play in dress. If it, oh sorry, in chess. If it flagged for an instant, an oversight is committed, resulting in injury or defeat. The possible moves being not only manifold, but in, involute, the chances of such oversights are multiplied. And in nine cases out of ten, it is the more concentrative rather than the more active player of chess who conquers. In drafts, on the contrary, where the moves are unique and have but little variation, the probabilities of inadvertence are diminished, and the mere attention being left comparatively unemployed, what advantages are obtained by either party are obtained by superior acumen. Poe goes on to take what he calls a less abstract case, involving the ending in checkers of two kings against two kings. He concludes that an analytical player will, quote, throw himself into the spirit of his opponent and thus come up with sole methods, sometimes indeed the absurdly simple ones, by which he may seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation. This argument is only half convincing, as it points to genuine distinctions but makes unduly large claims on their basis. The crucial points of distinction between the two games lie in two features. First, the greater variety of pieces and moves in chess with a concomitant range and distance of progress across the board. And two, the fact that capture is compulsory in drafts. This means it's possible to make exact calculations of play further ahead in checkers. <coughs> Psychologists have found that chess masters generally consider only two, three, four moves ahead in any serious way, except for some particularly dense situations and then ponder a limited range of counter moves from their opponent because you can't even a master can't, a grandmaster can't do very much more in most cases drive players offer them to consider a wider range of moves rejecting fewer alternatives at the outset and able to examine many more possible replies over the next few moves the standard set of positions or end games may involve as many as 80 moves to achieve victory one mistake uh, and a book win may turn into a draw. In this limited sense, drafts is arguably more scientific and chess more artistic, though there is certainly a, a poetry in the most elegant, elegant uh, drafts games combinations. Perhaps chess at the higher levels involves a little bit more feel, even if such a quality does 
have its place in America for an outstanding restorative. While chess has vastly more possible positions, some claim they are greater than the number of molecules in the universe, we should not leap to the conclusion that drafts is fatally limited in any way in this regard. The number of positions that can theoretically be attained on a drafts board following the rules of the game is calculated at 10 to the 18th. Think about that number. Um, it's meaningless, I know, but while the number of legally playable games is about 10 to the 31st. Therefore, an idiot savant who set out to memorise, say, 100 games a day, which would be pretty daunting, would require more than the number of days that Homo sapiens, indeed the Earth itself, has existed. Some of the possibilities inherent in this situation have been exploited by dedicated computers. While working on Enigma, Alan Turing actually devised a simple drafts program, but he had to write it out by, by hand, he obviously had no computer on which to install it. A major, figure, self uh, a major figure in early studies was Michael Arthur Samuel, who worked at the University of Illinois and then IBM in the 1950s, and was said to be an indifferent checker player, though a brilliant computer scientist. Subsequently, his program, lacking the power available to any programmers today, probably lacking the power you've got in your um, mobile or phone, um, was comfortably dispatched in match play by two great masters, Walter Hellman, American, Derek Alvey. British. Nonetheless, Sam's work to pave the way for the more sophisticated systems that have evolved in recent years. The best known example is Chinook, University of Saskatchewan, which reached the stage of challenging for the world title, in effect gaining this in 1997. I'll come back to that episode. Since then, Chinook has retired from competitive cross board play and has been diverted to exploring the possibilities of various positions e.g. end games involving a set number of pieces and then the array of openings. Its tasks have gradually been accomplished at an increasing tempo and several endings, uh, including those um, four checkers against four, were fully investigated about a decade ago. Now all the openings have been recently covered, that is to say all possible games analysed, um, about 140 if we define the um, opening by the first three moves, black, white, black. Others are banned because they're too one-sided. Um, and uh, you, you sacrifice a piece of the first move, say, and you never get it back. So it's about 140. Um, this is a commercially available um, program for playing um, drafts um, on a computer. All this research has made tools of astounding sophistication available to those interested in checkers. One online site offers an eight-piece database which has explored over 111 billion positions, as well as a seven-piece database covering about 20 million. These can amount to wins at a distance of about 100, 250 moves. You could say 250 moves ahead, you're going to win if you follow it. In practice, such tools have virtually no, or absolutely no direct benefit to players when the human brain is not wired up to this kind of database um, and must rely on judgment and memory and experience. But they provide material for practice, of course, and study. The most startling outcome of Chinook's work, and I'm missing a, a slide there, it's gone missing somewhere. Yeah, fine. Uh, was the announcement, some of you may have heard of, in the journal Science in the year 2007, that checkers had been solved. In fact, looking at the headlines, what this means that a quote, weak proof has been demonstrated that for both black and white, if they play their very best move at every occasion from start to finish, and you're not using one of those handful of band openings, they can always achieve a draw, at least, of course, or a win, whatever their opponent throws at them. And that is true for either black or white. So there's a rather specialised sense of solved, isn't it? Although the Chinook project used numerous computers, they didn't have enough capacity to store all the possible data, which runs at um, 10 to the 24 bytes. To keep this information stored would require hundreds of terabytes of space. And that's beyond present technical possibilities. 
In fact, the programmers were able to reach the conclusion on the basis of analysing problems with 10 or less pieces left on the board, covering only 40 trillion combinations out of the full number. The reason they do that is that you can get to these positions by various routes to get to that 10 piece position. So they didn't bother to play out all the earlier stages for the earlier case. This was a great coup for artificial intelligence, but it doesn't make the slightest difference to players. Okay, now a very quick word on the literature of um, drafts. A century ago, um, W.T. Cole's combina compilation, New York 1908, listed only 230 items, including books, books and journals, coming down to human numbers we, we can grasp again. Um, we could add a great deal, very much deal, to that now. To be sure, the flow has decreased in later decades, but it's never totally pitted out. A checker book dealer in Toronto offered over 2,000 items not long ago. That includes journals, separate issues of journals. The biggest collections survive in major US libraries. Largest of all is in the holdings of Cleveland Public Library. The collection of chess and checkers book assembled by a lawyer called John Griswold White contains something like 32,000 books and serials on the birth games. I think about a thousand or a little more of those are on drafts. There are other large connections at New York Public Library and Brooklyn Public Library. And there are a number of considerable private libraries, but they have mostly been dispersed. One of the earliest periodicals in English to cover any version of the game was the Philly Dorian, 1837-1838. Um, edited by a stockbroker, primarily chess but also dealing with checkers. The first specialist magazine is thought to be the Drafts Board, Newcastle on Time, 1869-72. After this, scores of magazine came into being for a shorter or longer time span, and a very few survived into the age of the internet. These counts omit the thousands and indeed tens of thousands of columns which from the 1850s ran in a host of newspapers and magazines in Britain, USA, the British Commonwealth, day in, day out for decades. Some may possibly be sold in on. The Daily Worker held on to its column until it was relaunched as the Morning Star in 1966 and disappeared. A full census of this material would divert, occupy the devoted researcher business for an entire lifetime. Many columns in small local papers around the world can be traced only because clippings are preserved in pages of old books on drafts. And I've got a few of those with clippings, unfortunately. Those books are in the States. But devoted readers regularly cut out newspaper columns and stuck them in their books. Most books in the field have a plain, not to say homespun, appearance. The majority of these were published in the 80s, between the 1860s and the 1940s and they tend to appear in cheaply printed volumes, which I'm afraid will reproduce very badly as slides, um, often without a proper binding and with fuzzily inked diagrams. The stock element is a series of long columns of print setting out the games in structure positions or solutions. Books of problems figure quite heavily. Uh, the most important early examples of, uh, well, uh, um, 1881, the Games of Drafts, Worcester, Massachusetts, 1881, um, and that um, Barker book. They often contain over a thousand problems, together with numerous instructional games. And the problem is quite so fuzzy. One feature which stands out in draft books is the treatment of openings. By the way, I should say I've got a copy of, of the Lyman book, and it seems to have been printed on papyrus rather than paper. <laughs> uh, when you touch it, the, page, the pages split off like the leaves of Van, of Van Rosa, you know, just for the composition. <laughs> Haven't got that here. For the treatment of openings. These tend to have less exotic names than their counterparts in chess, but some have expressive titles, mostly derived from Scottish usage. So we have Ayrshire Lassie, Laird and Lady, the Schubertian Maid of the Mill, Will of the Wisp, Alma, Dyke, Sota, or Suta, I think it is, Kelso, and so on. 
Bristol, which was another hotbed of the game, Black Doctor, and so on. A very large uh, literature exists to deal with different facets of the game. There are primers, manuals, detailed studies, a single opening, line of play, theoretical analysis of the principles required for mastering a particular style of play. A considerable amount of the output amount um, consists of two games played in tournaments or championship contests. How many there are is a very hazardous business to, to say the separate titles. But if we exclude elementary guides aimed at children, there are probably about 2,000 separate books in English on those. But I could be wrong, who's counting? So that to the uh, history of the game. I've got about um, 20 minutes left, so I'll try and keep to that. In fact, there is no social or cultural history otherwise of the English game. There are histories of the Polish. Yes. Googling Czechos history produces a website run by the, the Dutch scholar Ari van der Stup, who has compiled a work concentrating on the Polish form. And it placed most emphasis on the archaeological roots of the game. We know the form of drafts exist in early societies around the world. Forms that survive in the West probably derive from ancient Persia and Egypt. Some variety existed in Rome, in, in Greece, sorry, while a Roman game called Ratrantilai, Bandits, is described in a panegyric by the obscure poet Calponius Siculus on a member of the Piso family who led a revolt against Nero. The poem does not tell us how, how they played their game. The game of Alcurque, later Quercret, was introduced into Spain after the Moors took over the country. Just as we understand it, evolved in the Middle Age in France, Spain and then Britain. It was from this stem that the Polish Czechos later diverged. The earliest book on the subject was published in Valencia in 1547, Antonio Torquemada, as they say, no relation. As for the English game, it remained popular in Britain and was brought to America by the early colonists, though we haven't got many dependable records of how it was played up. For heuristic purposes, we could divide the subject into two parts. First, the game is played in the world at large as a leisure pursuit, and then second, the development of championships, tournaments, and professional matches. It's a pity we only have a few antiquarian and analytic references to these matters, with a bias towards rather limp institution surveys and a tendency to merely list tournaments and winners, salted with a few picturesque anecdotes. A new historicist would, would love um, this record. Nevertheless, a wealth of scattered of evidence exists to show that drafts played an enduring and substantial role in British and American life for a long time. The heyday of the game, roughly the second half of the 19th century and the first quarter of the 20th. The border scene represents the more promising era of inquiry, as this has been so badly neglected. In the era of William Payne and his successors, Drafts figures in print almost entirely as a pastime of the leisure class, uh, or as a province of professional gamesters, as in Painter and Piggott, the slides I showed you. The signs that the game retained its hold among the population at large, and this comes from fugitive references, for example, in household accounts and inventories. These remain to be explored. After industrialization, the game gradually became identified with working people more specifically with artisans, craftsmen, and tradesmen. Overwhelmingly, the record is of male players in public settings such as a club, a pub, or a workplace. Of course, women did play at home, but as often, their story has been effaced. You won't be surprised to hear that. Even today, there are surprisingly few women players at high level, possibly because dress has morphed into a somewhat nerdy activity. The great international grandmaster in chess, Judith, Judith Polgar, the Hungarian, has no equivalent. But the Women's World Championship was contested from 86, and there were two outstanding players in recent years from Northern Ireland and New Zealand women players. By common consent, the finest woman player historically was an American called Gertrude Huntley in the first half of the 20th century. It seems certain that increasing support for women's events will in time lead to a more level draft sport. 
and to something approaching equality and opportunity, which it certainly hasn't been. The game evolved most rapidly in Scotland, where our local competition was fierce, and a number of early champions emerged along with the early theorists. Grass is also strong in various parts of England, including, as I said, Bristol, uh, Newcastle, Liverpool degree, but London, London was always the strongest. However, as the vocabulary names of openings are quoted indicates, the Scottish influence was paramount until the end of the 19th century. The game began to spread rapidly in the States in the decade before the Civil War perhaps as a result of intense immigration at this juncture. The first periodical uh, to feature checkers regularly was the New York Clipper in the 1850s, 1855. A leading Scottish player made a tour of America that year. A column in the Chicago Leader starts in 1859. And uh, the first two bu books published in the States appear in New York and Philadelphia shortly after. Um, unquestionably, the most famous um, book of this kind uh, was called The American Drafts Player, uh, produced by Uncle Henry Spaeth in 1860. He was a businessman from Buffalo who produced a number of widely used plays for less advanced players. For the next 50 years, the tally of British and American publications remained in rough balance, but from around the time of the First World War, the centre of Chequers literature moved um, overwhelmingly towards America. As time went on, regular tournaments emerged at county, state, and, and, and count uh, level, eventually national levels, with a growth also of correspondence to us. And those of the game had several books of problems, such as those I uh, mentioned earlier, the Stearns one. And the clubs sprang out in the Loop in Chicago. Um, it's always been predominantly from the record an urban pastime mainly, uh, probably as a suburban following, if anything, today. Uh, around the 1890s, the American champion took to giving exhibitions of blindfold play, both chess and checkers. And he served for a while as the hidden operator of the supposed automaton called Ajib which is the successor of the famous Czech uh, chess uh, automata, the Turk. Uh, I haven't time to go into Turkey, you don't know about it. It elicited a long inquiry about Edgar Allan Poe when he saw it at Richmond, Virginia. Um, uh, it had a little operator hidden inside. Uh, there's a very interesting book about it. It was um, bought, it wasn't invented, it was invented by an Austin, but it was bought by... Um, uh, Meltzel, and then the Beethoven's metronome, you know, that, 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 one, that guy, and he took it to America, same guy. This harmless game, Johnson calls it, indeed itself both to labour unions and to employers, who perhaps saw it as an instrument, if not of control, at least of pacification, like meals on long haul air flights. Boards and checker pieces were cheap, and in emergencies they could be improvised. It's worth stressing that simple wooden chess sets were also very cheap in the Victorian world. Uh, sets could be hired for small subscription clubs, working men's clubs, whatever. Um, some seepage did take place into more elite sites, and Princeton University had a checkers club just after 1900. It was founded by a future professor of divinity, with what motives we can only surmise. For complicated historical and sociological reasons, chess and checkers moved steadily apart as elite and non-elite activities at this stage. Drafts became known not just as a less brainy pursuit, but also as a kind of more Renaissance game fit for those who made their living by their hands. Yet bosses too played the game, and a majority of the entrants in the increasing number of tournaments were in business, either as employers or lower management clerical positions. And some of the clubs formed then have a long history. In recent years, the most famous has been one in 42nd Street near Times Square in New York, but there's an older one in, in, in Brooklyn. Street Checkers was popular at one time, and still hands on in Central Park, I've been told I've never been to. Central Park, I don't know, New York, but 
there's still people there, uh, and there's still checkers, hustlers, who will um, you know, bet you and let you win one and then cheat out all your money. In many quarters, the game acquired an association with thrift and industry and other bourgeois virtues. So that Franklin had uh, linked to chess, fit for aspirational types. It sent, enters American mythology, particularly um, in texts such as the autobiography of Andrew Carnegie, which was published posthumously um, in 1920. Carnegie described, I think I'm going to slide off. Carnegie, looking at resolution, attentive. He describes how he cried his first big break in business in Pittsburgh, having come as he known from Scotland, as a result of conversation between his uncle and the manager of the local telegraph over a game of drafts. Both are enthusiastic players. And can he add upon such trifles do the most momentous consequences often have on really The providential sweep of the narrative indicates it was not altogether trivial. Carnegie's whole future rested on a game played by reliable men of the world who acted as the gatekeepers to posterity. Posterity, sorry, gatekeepers to prosperity. Within the ideology of the genre, such a chain of events was more than simply fortuitous. The gospel of wealth linked to like to find its key texts in the everyday occupation of worthy individuals. Moreover, Johnson could have reminded Carnegie that seeming trifles often have their root in something more substantial. A disproportionate role in all this was taken by the immigrant community in America. From all the main European groups, the Irish contribution was limited, Drafts was certainly not banned in Boston, but the game perhaps made less impact there than uh, some other places. In general, the Mediterranean countries provided less encouragement to the game than immigrants from Northern and Central and Eastern Europe. Long cold winters appear to have fostered dedication to the game. We hear of rabbis instructing their young charges, using checkers more as an intellectual training ground than as a source of moral edification. Undoubtedly, the Jewish community uh, did most to foster the game. And as with chess, you know, um, they provided a large segment of the most distinguished players. They often provided incentives to their members by way of prizes or public recognition. Still, most people played not to improve themselves but for sheer enjoyment. This preference Johnson would have understood and applauded. If, as he said, no man is a hypocrite in his pleasures and even the diversions of Ramla Gardens came to merit the title of a place of innocent recreation, then ours of the draft board could scarcely have deserved an essential. The story of professional drafts is too long to rehearse here, but a few words may be said about just half a dozen ma major figures, we could choose many more. The first is James Wiley, 1818 to 1889, 99, who in the 1850s took over the title of world champion from a fellow Scot. This was incidentally one of the very first contexts in which the term world champion was used. And then to usage, general usage. For the main render of his life, Wiley barnstormed around Britain and America, playing for small stakes against all comers, and putting his title up for competition by any rival with suitable fans. You know, it's gone now. I mean, most of you are too young to remember, but people like Sugar Ray Robinson would go around the world and put their championship on the line, whoever they were fighting in boxing. Wiley was a the son of a trooper in the Scots Greys who fought at Waterloo, came from Ayrshire. He acquired the nickname of the Herd Laddie, a form of words that might have come from Scots novels, if you think about it, on the basis of a single herding expedition from the border country to Edinburgh. In effect, he was the first full-time professional, dominating the theory and practice of the game, much as W.G. Grace, his immediate contemporary, did in cricket. He probably commanded more fame in his lifetime than anyone else in the game ever has. Not as much as Grace, of course, but still a lot. For Spell, he lost his title to Robert Yates from Brooklyn, who actually defeated uh, Wiley at the age of 18. 
1958. He became a, a um, he, he left soon after to study medicine. He became a physician at Flatbush Hospital in New York, and then signed on as a physician to steamer the Rotterdam Line. And on his very first trip, the ship's doctor, he died of typhus at the age of 28, sealing his reputation as the Paul Morphy of Gas, if you know about Paul Morphy. By the way, Morphy allegedly called Czechos a game for beggars, but um, it may be of Among 20th century players, there's time only to mention five very briefly. Willie Ryan, uh, 1979 54, was the one who was known as the Bronx Comet was a brash extrovert who would play anyone for any amount and produced a stream of books still useful if branches and self-advertising. Uh, read that, that's an example. He made a full-time living out of the game and one tiny number who could do that. Then there is uh, probably Cotton, but this is a kind of very flamboyant dedication to a fellow dust player. Then there's Asa Long, who lived from 1904 to 1999, world champion for a time in the 1930s. He won his first American title, aged 18, again very young, in 1922, the youngest still to have done that. He won it for the last time in 1984, at the age of 80, the oldest of Harvard titles. So if you can imagine being a national champion for 60, at a gap of 62 years, and it's just astounding. Most interesting in this context perhaps is a man called Samuel Gonotsky of Polish origin. Um, he immigrated his family from an early age, grew up in Brooklyn. When little more than a boy, he began to score important wins. Uh, in, in Chicago for a short time. He served as the main, the little man concealed inside the Ajib um, player automaton, allegedly a, an automatic player of the dross. He, he was concealed inside. Um, at the, in 929, he won a very important title. I could, could not ask you here. No. Um, but. Um, he died of tuberculosis very shortly afterwards, at 26. One more remarkable player who uh, never became indis an indisputed world champion was a man called Newell Banks, 1887 to 1977. They either seemed to very long, live a long time or a very short term. And his particular strength related to one outstanding proficiency. I'll just give you a similar example to stand for very many. On one occasion, he conducted 75 drafts games and 26 bluff chess games at the same time as well as six games of blindfold drafts. He won 65 of the drafts games, drawing 10, won 22 at chess with one loss, two draws. His blindfold score was four wins, two draws, so in all these games simultaneously he lost just one game. Finally, um, by way of almost universal consent, the greatest player who has ever lived was a man called Marion Tinsley, who lived from 1927 to 1995, the undefeated world champion. He was a professor of mathematics at Florida State University in Tallahassee, but also an ordained Baptist minister, given occasionally to startling born-again pronouncements. <laughs> Among his multifarious achievements was his victory over the computer Chinook, an earlier version in 1992. This was before the blue, you know, the chest there. Late in the contest, Tinsley, who had not lost for several years, by the way, a single game, I don't mean a tournament. Oh, he'd lost one game, then. okay. Late in the tournament, he had to salvage a draw when placed in a desperate situation. The computer had apparently got on top of him. After racking his memory, he came up with a line of play he'd encountered three decades before, by chance, in a single game. It turned out to be a critical move, and he won the contest by a margin of two points. The last game was close, but after search a searching 63 move uh, game, computer indicated the draw's outcome, and so a tie was agreed. 
Newspapers quoted the win winner stating that he had the better programmer, namely God. <laughs> a rematch was uh, scheduled for 1994, but Tinsley had to withdraw after six draws owing to illness, and he died of pancreatic cancer, sadly, in the following April. Very soon afterwards, Tinu forged ahead of its human rivals, and even Tinsley, with all his gifts, would have been obliged to concede superiority. It seems appropriate that he was spared that. The time came when he was, had to give it to the computer, Chinook. Okay, now this final little coda, brief last paragraph. How would Johnson have viewed the progress of his harmless game? Today, checkers is reinventing itself in the computer age, but whatever happens, it will scarcely ever regain the prominence it had for almost a century. That was the product of a particular society and a historically determined civilization which has gone. In the I'm not going to talk about this, by the way, this, this is a sentimental story about Father and Son being reunited to check his so and so blurry. In the current global climate, the appeal is limited by the lack of a single world game. Politics has long developed bedeviled checkers with breakaway groups threatening the governing body. So like, as in boxing, there are alternative champions and championships. And the state has been balkanised, as in heavyweight boxing. International matches and state championships still go on, county championships here, and a wider array of players has emerged around the world, as I think there will be more women in the future. Dress columns in newspapers have given way to crosswords and Sudoku. Unlike the case of poker, there have been no moves into peak time television. I don't know if you haven't had much poker here on television, but then states a lot of it. No one has ever dropping, no one these days drops in for a game at the Y, as they used to. It's possible, all the same, to play strangers online, to upload amazing databases, and to assess more technically advanced resources than Wiley, Gnotsky, or even Marion Tinsley ever dreamt of. In any case, Johnson would have relished the fact that the game went on stretching the mind and the will and the character of so many players over the past 200 years. Triflers may find or make anything a trifle. Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, Pat has indicated that he'd be uh, happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that we may have. Um, perhaps, Pat, if I might, might just start yeah. by you said a lot about you know the history of the game, uh, the the literature that was associated with it. But presumably, there is a parallel history to be written about the artifacts, you know, the boards and the and the pieces that, uh, you know, presumably, as with as with with chess pieces, are became elaborated and were you know, destined for particular kinds of, of, of markets. Is, is, there, is there anything written on the, on the, you know, the artifacts associated with it? Or was it Not much that I know of, and it would be a duller story than chess, yes. obviously, what you can do with yes. chess pieces. And there are occasional very luxury, luxury items or very exotic variants on it. That, I think, has not been a, a major part of it. But just history. More of it would be to do with using very primitive substitutes and you know stories of prisoners of war who couldn't fake <coughs> chess but you know could use some stones or yes. something. Yeah. 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 Anyone questions they would like to put to uh, please? Can I ask um, one of the of course engaging things about chess is how frequently and sometimes importantly it features in lots of form, cultural forms, but particularly perhaps in literature. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure everybody here can think of examples um, um, of chess games uh, in literature that's, that matter to the story of, of a novel or, or a poem or whatever. Um, I find it much harder to think of examples of, of checkers or chess, uh, of checkers or, or, or drafts in literature, but am I being dealt with to are there examples? People in Saul Bellow novels play checkers with each other or 
That would be a likely place, so. isn't it, since he moved to Chicago and that's a big centre. I don't know. You know, the short answer is you're right. I mentioned the, the, the games that played at the Café de la Régence in, in Diderot, and there's the Pope thing. That isn't essential to the story of Morgan. I think the reason Poe puts in is that he thinks there's a kind of detective power in finding the right moves in drafts, which is analogous to what we do to sort out the murders in the Morgan in some way. But no, you're right. Um, relatively few examples, I think, in um, mainstream uh, literature. And there's no kind of, as far as I know, there's no kind of George Steiner um, going to tournament like he went to Fish and Spassky, was it, one of those tournaments and kind of theorising from watching the tournament. There hasn't been much, which could perfectly well be done. But it's, it's less obvious. I think you know, a journalist can go to a, a chess tournament and you, know, you could talk about the sweat on people's brow and this kind of thing, uh, this kind of stuff. But also you can see the complexities of the, of the game evolving as there are fewer pieces on the board and the knights have disappeared or whatever. And even the non-expert, I think, can see a kind of obvious symbolic battle going on. In order to do that with just, you certainly can do it if you know the game and the positions. But you've got to know the game pretty well to understand. Well, in some cases, even has the advantage, because a complete amateur going to two experts in a certain stage of a just game, just glancing at the board, would perhaps think it looked very equal, or perhaps black or white had a slight advantage was in fact, it could be that it's really, though the forces are equal, but it's a very imbalanced game and one is clearly in the, in the centre. So you've got to know the game to understand the drama of it and so on. And uh, I, as far as I know, not many writers have been... Uh, I could tell you some one or other writers have played drafts, but to bring it into a, a, a main text, no, I don't know. That's fine. Uh, can I unfairly draw on our acquaintance over the last uh, 50 odd years no, no <laughs> to express my surprise that in all this time I've never heard you mention drama <laughs> where and when and how did you become obviously fascinated by it that's not a question about my, my, my <laughs> paper is it um, was it I think in my early Russian in national service no, before, in, in my teens didn't have much time when we knew each other in Cambridge. Um, I've played it intermittently and I'm not a, an expert player. I, I, I collect old gas books. But has it come from your family or from school no. or an institution? Uh, it's not an interesting history. <laughs> uh, I think if, if you get into it, a certain kind of mind, it, it, it is a, a very absorbing subject. It has an interesting um, literature, not in the sense of being in creative literature, but an interest in literature of its own. And I think the modern computer developments are absolutely fascinating because without really solving the game, what they have been able to do is explore an incredible number of permutations, really as a kind of test of certain kinds of artificial intelligence, kind of algorithms and so on. <laughs> And in that way, um, it's in some ways what it takes to kind of follow the logic of a chess game, check, checkers game, has certain affinities with working out algorithms for a computer, you know, and programming. So I think it's you know, interesting in that, that way. Anyone else a question for uh, Pat? Please, yes. Um, I was quite interested that you said chess, uh, or, sorry, checkers, <laughs> achieved the peak of popularity in the decade before the Civil War in America. It's, it became, not at the peak, that's when it started, so I put it badly. Right, so it Pat started. Was talking about it in 1841 was mm -hmm. rather ahead of any popular yeah. interest in it. Well, there was some, but it grew very rapidly for some reasons in the 1850s. For what yeah. reason, I don't know. I think after a wave of immigration. 
just thinking about um, the comments about checkers at the beginning of murders and the reward in yeah. relation to the rest of the story. Yeah. Uh, the story is sometimes read as a critique of slavery. Okay. And I'm just wondering if Poe was also interested in the symbolism of black and white in the game. I don't come to that. Maybe. By the way, it's often, as in um, Lewis Carroll, often red and white. And, uh, um, I had honestly not thought of that and have to look at it again, but in, in principle it's, 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 it's possible. There isn't much record, I think, of blacks playing the game very intensively. Um, the most popular game in the African American community is certainly pool. So they never played a very big role in the mainstream um, checkers. I just think that Poe was had a prescience about um, mm -hmm. his country becoming divided mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. having lived in the north and the south, he was very conscious of the differences. And, um, well, he, he saw the um, automaton and wrote about that, I think about 1830, very early in Richmond, Virginia, which is not too far from Mason Dixon Island. So, as you say, he, he had awareness, I'm not a pro scholar, but I know enough to realize that what you say is, is true. Whether that actually is expressed in this black and white sentence, I, I, I haven't thought of that. It, it, it isn't really explicitly brought out in terms of black and white in that text, is it? Um, it isn't, but Poe would have to be indirect about that. Situation. Okay, good. Writing for a popular magazine. Well, I'm very interested in that, but your, your, your word on this carries much more authority than mine. Does, you know? <coughs> oh, I, it's just a suggestion that occurred, it just occurred to me while I was listening. I, I'd never thought of that. Please. Do Pan uses it in the in the room more is an illustration of the writing community method, doesn't he? He's, he's trying to show how he could break in on the unnamed narrator's thoughts, that showy trick that Sherlock Holmes comments on in the uh, study in Scars and then proceeds to do exactly the same in the sign of four and the, the dancing men. But I've always thought that actually Poe was being sophistical here. And, and when you're suggesting that actually in drafts you need to think ahead many more moves than you do in chess. If grandmasters in chess are only thinking four or five moves ahead, in drafts in theory you should be thinking many more moves ahead than that. And it, It's more a statement than a question, but did yeah. Poe be aware of that? Was Poe himself a, 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 a keen draft player? We don't know that even. No. I've always thought it was such a a yeah. silly salute suggestion to, to make, but yours, what, what you suggested is that perhaps it isn't. Well, it, you raised two issues, I think, Alan. Um, the first is, um, is it in some sense a kind of narratological metaphor, if I understand you right, right, along the lines of Conan Doyle, is that what yes. you're saying? Well, Conan Doyle picks it up straight away, but then the, 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 the Sherlock Holmes pooh poos it, but then he does exactly the same thing um, virtually uh, uh, down, he's not wandering through Paris when he does it, but exactly the same thing with Watson at the start of the sign of the floor and the start okay. of the dancing man. I've forgotten it breaks, in, breaks in on, on, on uh, um, uh, Watson's thoughts by saying, well, I see you're not going to invest in South African securities, you know. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. That, well, I don't remember the Sherlock Holmes stories well enough. Um, in the case of Poe, I think something like that may be going because on the face of it, it looks rather clunky kind of episode, doesn't it? it, it why is it there? Um, and then, what was the second point? Um, well, just that, that, what that in fact in chess, the, oh, yeah, sorry. in drafts, the, the, perhaps the, you do need The to argument, the only argument I could have come up with was that he puts this bit in as a kind of, not quite allegory, but a kind of example of how far-sightedness in the Francian way will take you into certain problematic issues and um, that the 
therefore solving um, detective puzzles requires a certain kind of patience and cunning and ability to um, reason things out and it isn't like chess where he's arguing, I think misleadingly in many ways, that it's kind of a lot of flair and that um, people are always making mistakes and he seems to be saying that all chess games, you know the victory goes to the one who concentrates better and all get chess games are won or lost because somebody, you know remembers or, for, or forgets some important move you know, they won or lost by slips which surely is not true of chess so I think his argument about the difference between chess and dress is actually not wholly watertight but I believe he may have been making it for the purpose of suggesting that what a detective requires is not a kind of um, uh, chess player's kind of um, um, attention to detail but a, a wider kind of absorption in a whole situation which you take account of it. I think this is again a pretty clunky argument that, that's the best, I don't know others can do better that's the best reason I conceive because I, I, I mentioned this idea to two to, to my colleagues in, in, in the States, and, you know, especially in the American literature, no about pro. And um, two of them actually said to me, um, "Oh, I've, I've forgotten that. You know, I've taught the, 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 the story several times, read it many times. I never bother taking any notice of that passage. So if we can find any justification at all, you know, why, why he would have put it in, I guess we're we're ahead of the, some of the specialists." Well, Pat, I think we're getting close now to the time when we might move uh, from this more formal setting to, to carrying on the conversation informally uh, over a glass of wine. But before we do that, uh, can I just uh, thank you on behalf of us all for your lecture. Um, firstly, I shall never, ever be able to look at a checkerboard again without thinking of the way you counterpointed the voices of Boswell and Johnson. Uh, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, checkers is the new Valium, and uh, certainly Chinese checkers has nothing to do with China, but everything to do with Sweden. So uh, uh, thank you very much indeed. And may I uh, invite uh, us all to uh, come down to the ground floor, to the crush hall, the area between the, uh, the Macmillan and the beverage halls for a glass of wine and to continue uh, conversation with Pat. But I have to say to you that the entrance ticket uh, to that glass of wine is that you sign uh, the attendance sheet uh, just outside uh, the door uh, to this hall uh, so that we have a record of those who attended. So may we uh, please all thank Pat again for uh, a fabulously entertaining and informative lecture. Pat, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.